Good afternoon. My name is Nicole and I'm the Data Officer for Saving Scotland's Red Squirrels and today I'll be talking to you about the Community Hub Legacy. I'll begin by showing you our data flows, then move on to our roadmap to Hub Legacy. I'll recap some of the roles I've covered during this presentation and wrap up with the challenges and benefits on our road to the legacy phase. Now starting with our data flows. Staff and volunteers can add sightings, control and survey data as well as contact details, training records and volunteering hours directly through our website. Anyone with a Hub account can view, edit and export their data. All the records entered onto the Hub are automatically added to our back-end Scottish Squirrel database, a nationwide data set for squirrel records in Scotland that's secure, protected and backed up daily for resilience. Similarly, almost all data imported to the database is reflected on the Hub, with the exception of sightings data we get from local record centres, which remains in the database. Control data from Grey Squirrel officers trap loan scheme participants in the north and trapping records from estates in the Forestry Grant Scheme are all imported to the database and reflected on the Hub. As you can see, we have a really simple process for collecting and collating data into one centralised system, but this wasn't always the case. Prior to the Hub, trapping records were imported to our old control database. However, a lot of data was unprocessed and remained in a variety of formats such as scanned PDFs, Word documents and spreadsheets. Sightings from local record centres were uploaded to the old Scottish Squirrel database, which also contained public sightings from our old website. We had more disparate recording systems for feeder box survey data and volunteering information, including contact details, training records and volunteering hours. Our data was spread across multiple parallel and overlapping recording systems, making it difficult to access and retrieve information. With the launch of the Hub, all historic data was imported to the new Scottish Squirrel database, creating a centralised place for SSRS data, making it easy to access and share. Which brings me to my next slide. In the database, we've set up multiple SQL queries, which do all the wrangling needed to extract figures for reporting, pull data to create maps and tools for staff, generate data sets to share with scientists and researchers, some of whom you'll have heard from during this conference, and prepare an annual data set of squirrel records to upload to the National Biodiversity Network, aka the NBN. The Trust believes in making data as accessible as possible to aid science and research in conservation and biodiversity across the nation. The NBN hosts species occurrence records from local groups and record centres across the UK, which can be downloaded for research purposes. The Scottish Squirrel database records have been downloaded from the NBN 944 times in the last 12 months, with an overall 32 citations for this data set. Before moving on to the next section, I'd like to show you some of the tools we've created to give staff better access to Hub data. Having a centralised database means it's relatively easy to create tools for staff to gain better access to data. We've created a front-end database using Microsoft Access, so staff can export data in a variety of pre-prepared formats. We've also built an interactive web app using Esri products, ArcPro and ArcGIS Online, providing all the data that's on the hub, plus some additional layers such as Grey Squirrel Preferred Habitat and our Squirrel Pox sampling results, providing staff access to pop-ups, filters and attribute tables. Now we understand a bit more about the SSRS data flows, let's move on to our roadmap to Hub Legacy. In 2017, the Scottish Wildlife Trust worked closely with our developers Exegesis and Redpaint, who host our database, to design, develop and test the new online community hub. After a lot of hard work, the community hub was launched in 2018 and our historic data was imported to the new database. During this year, a lot of time is spent creating resources for staff and volunteers on how to use the hub, as well as providing training workshops to help people get to grips using the new website. In 2019, we continued to run training workshops for the volunteer networks in South Scotland, with a focus on how to add data to the hub and how the admins can manage their group online. We added functionality that allowed us to recruit volunteer sightings verifiers to help staff verify the large number of public sightings we get each year. I'll talk some more about our volunteer verifiers in the next few slides. 
Volunteer verifiers can log on to the website to get full access and edit rights to sighting submitted within their remit area. Verifiers check details of the sighting and location and verify the record is either confirmed, pending, invalid or duplicate. Now let's take a look at the different remit areas of our volunteer verifiers. You can see from the map on the left that we have several volunteer networks with active verifiers, most of whom have been recruited within the last year, with 10 people having actively verified over 1,000 sightings. Moving on to North Scotland on the right, we can see that we have volunteers covering the Highlands, Tayside and Fife. We have one verifier in the Highland who was our first recruit back in 2019 and she's processed over 2,500 sightings during this time. In Tayside, we have one volunteer verifier who was recruited this year and she's already processed over 2,000 sightings. And last but not least, in Fife we have four volunteer verifiers, most of whom joined us this last year, and they've verified almost 1,500 sightings in their region so far. Having volunteer verifiers is a great way to help staff in these regions. The Highlands and Fife aren't project areas, so previously staff from Tayside and Edinburgh had to verify all of the sightings that came into these regions on top of their own areas. Similarly, before the help of our Tayside verifier, staff spent a lot of time processing sightings here as it's such a big area with a high volume of public sightings coming through each year. And finally, having volunteer verifiers in the south gives the network groups more power to manage their areas effectively, moving towards independence for the groups in the legacy phase. As you can see from the bar chart, the number of sightings verified by volunteers has increased over the years as we recruit more verifiers, starting from almost 500 in 2019 to over 5,500 records processed by volunteers in 2021 at the time of recording. To put this in perspective, on average staff have verified 13,000 sightings a year since 2019. And this year, almost a third of our sightings have been processed by volunteers. Now let's go back to our roadmap. In 2020, we hired a contractor to digitise a backlog of historic trapping records from our trap loan scheme participants and estates in the forestry grant scheme. Thousands of records in the form of scanned PDFs, Word documents and spreadsheets were all digitised and then imported to our hub database, which means staff now have access to these records at full resolution on the hub and control volunteers can see the results summarised by Tetrad on the online maps. We also added a space to record shooting data and increase the hub permissions and rights for our volunteer network admins, which I'll talk about in the next few slides. We added shooting pages to the hub after recognising that some of our volunteers shoot as a form of grey squirrel control and therefore they needed a place to record this data. <clears throat> the number of shot squirrels by Tetrad was added as a layer to the grey squirrel control map online for all control volunteers to access. Now let's take a look at the increased network admin permissions. From here on forth, I'll use mock data to protect the identity and activities of our volunteer network members. To prepare our network groups for independence, we increase the permission rights the network admins have on the hub, providing them with access and oversight to data from members of their group to help with planning and monitoring activities in their area. The admins can now view, edit and export group members' trapping data as well as being able to assign traps to group members. Admins also have the same permissions and rights for shooting records and for feeder box survey data. That's the main milestones of 2020 covered. Now let's go back to our roadmap. Moving on to the current year, 2021, a lot of development work has taken place to help prepare us for the legacy phase. In the summer, we added bulk upload functions to our trapping and shooting pages and at the time of recording, we're about to go live with survey data exports, further network admin permissions, and a new South Scotland coordinator role, which we've nicknamed Super Admins. I'll talk a bit more about this in the next few slides. In the summer, we added the ability for network admins to upload trapping and shooting data from their network members, which allows the admins to collate control data from their group and upload it to the hub without having to manually enter every record one by one. This is useful for groups of a high volume of trapping data that's too cumbersome to manually enter, or if there are group members who are not so tech savvy and would like somebody to process their data on their behalf. 
Now let's move on to some of the features we're about to roll out if they aren't already live. Previously, members of the hub could download their trapping, shooting and sightings records, but not their survey data. Now we've added the export data to Excel button to the feeder box page, allowing all members of the feeder box survey group to export their survey data, with the admins being able to export for their whole group. Moving on to an update in the network admin permissions. When network members log on to their private page, they have access to grayscale control and sightings layers on their map. We've increased the data access for admins so that when they log on, they can also see results of their group's feeder box surveys, as well as a layer showing where group members are based so that the admins can easily deploy the closest person to an area of activity, concern or interest, providing an effective management tool for the group's conservation efforts. The final major update from this year is that we've created a South Scotland coordinator role for select network admins, aka our super admins. The super admins will gain read-only access to data that falls within South Scotland to help with reporting, analysis, planning and monitoring on a landscape scale, as volunteers in the South take on more responsibilities and independence in preparation for the legacy phase. The South Scotland coordinators can view and explore all confirmed sightings records from South Scotland, all trapping records, all shooting records and all survey data. Today we've went over the major milestones that have helped prepare the SSUS community for Hub Legacy, where volunteers take on more responsibility and independence in the next phases of the project. It should be noted that there have been many minor updates throughout these years to improve user experience and efficiency of the Hub, as well as the major milestones and achievements we've covered today. Before wrapping up, I'd like to briefly recap the volunteer Hub roles I've mentioned throughout this presentation. Anyone can join the Hub and become a subscriber to submit and manage your data online or join a volunteering group, gaining access to nationwide maps. Sightings verifiers can view and edit sightings to verify records in their area. Network admins can view, add, edit and export group members' data, as well as being able to create training records and volunteering hours for their group. And finally, our South Scotland coordinators, aka our super admins, can view and explore all sighting, survey and control data from South Scotland. To wrap up, I'd like to go over some of the challenges and benefits on our road to Hub Legacy, starting with the challenges so we end on a positive note. Firstly, designing, launching and updating the Hub has been a huge undertaking. An incredible amount of work went into designing the interface, the multiple user journeys and role permissions on the Hub, as well as designing a database that can pull many complex data sets together from a variety of sources in different formats. Meanwhile, ensuring we protected personal and sensitive data and guaranteeing GDPR compliance along the way. One challenge that can't really be avoided is that the system will never suit everybody. However, we do our best to accommodate the needs of volunteers and balance this with the needs of staff as well as the needs of the project. Like with any new tool or technology, there are always teething problems. Our volunteers and staff come from a range of backgrounds, not all of whom are great with technology and can find new systems difficult to get to grips with, especially for staff and the network admins, who have far more complex permissions and functions than regular users do. To help combat these difficulties, we've provided a wealth of training resources through manuals and videos, as well as training workshops for staff and volunteers. And now the volunteer networks are doing a great job of training one another. Now briefly going over the benefits which have been highlighted throughout this presentation. The online community hub and database pulls conservation records from staff, volunteers, estates and landowners across Scotland into one centralised place, creating greater access to data and helping to build a nationwide picture of red squirrel conservation in Scotland. The hub brings the SSRS community together, it aids science and research, empowers staff and volunteers and all of these features making it truly one of a kind. Thank you for listening.